The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. Tonight, millennial power, a new generation rises up at the ballot box. How will these newly engaged voters influence politics in Chicago and across the country? And back from the brink, Illinois lawmakers finally pass a spending plan that will open schools and pay for essential services. But are they just kicking a bigger can down the road? Plus, what lies beneath? Summer fun leads to a new warning for swimmers and boaters. How to enjoy the season and protect yourself from electric currents coursing through the water. Stay with us for these stories and more tonight on In the Loop. Good evening, I'm Chris Bury. The millennial generation, even larger and more liberal than the baby boomers, has the potential to significantly change the country's politics. During the primary season, more voters under the age of 30 cast their ballots for Bernie Sanders than for Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump combined. But now that Clinton is the presumptive nominee, how will those who supported Sanders impact the vote in November? And will some even turn to Trump? In the Loop met with a handful of millennials living here in Chicago to find out. I think that it is wonderful that we're at a point in our nation's history where um, a woman may end up being president. I think it's about time. Uh, I think that's really important. Bernie inspired me. I believed in a vision. I believe in the, the movement that he's creating. Um, I can't say right now that I would definitely cast my vote for Hillary, though. Two young women, both in their late 20s, both passionate voters, both very active in the community. Kathleen Dillon, the political coordinator at the Heartland Cafe in Rogers Park, believes that for millennials like her, this election is not about a traditional liberal agenda, but a movement for real change. The difference I see between um, liberal and progressive is the action element. Um, and not just spouting off ideals about justice, but actively moving toward a more just society. Amanda Weaver, director of a grassroots political organization called Reclaim Chicago, says Sanders appealed to her because she's grown disillusioned with most other politicians. When I see millions and millions and billions of dollars being put into candidates' campaigns, like I know who they're working for at the end of the day, and it's not me and my interests. Zachary Cook, a professor of political science at DePaul University, says millennials are more likely to be liberal because many are under considerable economic stress. This is a generation that is struggling right now to find its place in the American workforce. And I do think you see that pushes them a little bit left on some of these economic issues. Cook has written extensively about the millennial generation born between 1982 and 2000. He says they are more likely to believe the American economic system is rigged against them. Interestingly, I think you would see some common ground there among some millennials who gravitate, really gravitate, to Bernie Sanders on the one hand, and others, for different reasons, depending on their diagnosis, who gravitate to Donald Trump. For example, 26-year-old Chicagoan Dan Gallego supports Trump. He co-founded a super PAC called The Art of the Deal. Well, I formed it because I think Donald Trump is the only candidate who represents true change and the only candidate who's going to actually solve the problems that we're facing. The Northwestern University graduate, who now works as an operations manager, believes members of his generation need to be less idealistic and more pragmatic when looking at the candidates and the issues. I think in large part they really do care about the future of this, this country um, a great deal. Um, I think a lot of them are a little bit misguided. Um, they look at politics more at the surface level, more at the, the emotional level, rather than actually getting into the statistics and um, really the root cause of some of these problems. Last person in the park is Rodney. egg. 33-year-old Jamal Cole is also part of the millennial generation, but he says local action is more likely to lead to real change than national politics. I try to figure out what's, um, what I can do to, to make my block a safer place. And once we are connected on our block, then we can start thinking about you know, um, the entire, our entire neighborhood. Then we can start thinking about our entire city. Three years ago, Cole formed a nonprofit called My Block, My Hood, My City. 
It takes teens living in troubled neighborhoods to experience other parts of the city. A lot of teenagers told me they had never been downtown or they'd never seen the lake. Um, consequently, their entire worldview or what they thought was possible for themselves and their peers was geographically bound to their community. According to Pew Research, 50% of millennials consider themselves politically independent, not reliably liberal or conservative. Whatever their political affiliations, millennials have voted less than other age groups in recent presidential elections. Many cite social issues such as gay marriage and immigration as motivating factors in voting. It seems almost uh, silly to me that it's something that we even have to legislate on is uh, who can marry who. You know, I kind of look at everybody the same, so um, I absolutely support equal rights for everyone. When it comes to immigration, Gallegos points out that his father moved here legally from Mexico. Still, he supports Trump's plan to build a wall and deport undocumented immigrants. Curing this nation from any foreign person who wants to come in illegally because we cannot vet those people. We have no idea who's coming in. But Kathleen Dillon finds Trump's harsh anti-immigration rhetoric appalling. We can't have people coming over to the states and children who are born here being stuck here while their parents are sent away. And while Gallego supposes any form of gun control, others think it's time for a change. The NRA and, and big money is keeping us from having an honest conversation about what gun control could look like. How does someone get to the point where they just lose all compassion towards somebody and pull out a big tool to kill that person? How can we reach that person first? But Cole says more gun control probably won't work because he says criminals don't obey laws. Despite differences about how to address gun control, climate change, and economic struggles, the millennials we spoke to are united in their passion about the issues, and many are looking for a dramatic change in the status quo. We're all too revved up to quit. This, Like Bernie said, this was never just about the presidency, it was about a movement. and. I don't think those of us who have really supported this campaign are just going to let that die. One other note about millennials, the most educated generation in American history is seeing some of the slowest growth in wages. Since 2009, paychecks for recent college graduates have grown 60 percent more slowly than those of the general population. And now joining us to talk about this and other trending topics are Pat Brady, founder of Next Generation Strategies, James Thindwa, contributing columnist for In These Times magazine, and Susan Garrett, chair of the nonpartisan organization Illinois Campaign for Political Reform, and welcome, everyone. So, Pat, let me begin to you with you. What difference do you see the millennials making in November? Could, could potentially have a huge difference if the Bernie people um, go over to Trump and actually put Donald Trump back in the game in an election I think he's going to lose badly, but it'll be interesting to see where they go. And that's the lead-in segment was, it was very interesting on the, how closely the millennials are, kind of the full circle to Bernie and Donald Trump. Um, I think it's a great sign that they're, they're so engaged. You know, and I hope the Republican Party, which I rep have represented, understands that the millennials look at things differently. We need to get off the social issues. They don't care about gay marriage. I mean, they care about it, but they don't think that, that uh, gay people should not be allowed to get married. And I think if the Republican Party does that and emphasizes that we're going to get you a better job, not like we've seen in the last eight years, we're going to make your life better and we're going to give you a, show you a better path, I think the millennials actually probably are more conservative than that leading piece might lead you to believe. James, but the millennials, if you look at the voting numbers, they overwhelmingly went for Sanders. Mm -hmm. Do you see them getting as enthused about Hillary Clinton? Well, you know, it was referenced here that uh, uh, millennials are sort of fickle voters. Uh, they don't vote very frequently. And, and part of the reason people don't vote in general is that uh, the candidates are really not speaking to their issues. And uh, I think what happened with Bernie Sanders is that they, for the first time in a long time, they heard a candidate really speak to those gut issues, those real issues for them, free uh, college and, and, and universities. But do you think uh, they'll have that change. same enthusiasm and, for Clinton? Well, I think that, for example, yesterday she came out with a plan that almost mirrors Bernie Sanders' plan uh, for, for uh, free college and, and So and she's moving in his direction. And, uh, yeah, she's moving in his direction. And the more she does that, the more likely she is to motivate these voters uh, in November. Susan, what about the point that Pat just made, that some of these Sanders voters may move over to the Trump side? They may, and I think we're going to see a split. 
Um, I just from watching the video, I think that um, these voters are pragmatic, which is what we heard. Um, they're maybe not as partisan as we think they are. They're interested in issues that really matter to them. And they're thinking long term. You know, we've all heard about these college um, expenses, how expensive it is to go to college, the debt that these students have been faced with over the years. That's something that's really important to them. They're going to identify with candidates who present them with issues that really are going to make a difference. Change is a key word here. I don't know how the millennials feel about the budget deal that was made in Springfield uh, the other day. Um, it's a stopgap measure that will at least get schools open in the fall and fund essential city services. Uh, but even Governor Rauner, when he announced it, didn't sound too enthusiastic. Let's listen to the governor. This is not a budget. This is not a balanced budget. This is not a solution to our long-term challenges. This is a bridge to reform. That's what this is. This is a bridge to reform, a bipartisan bridge to reform. Pat, after a year without a budget, is this something that we should be celebrating? Yeah, because it's for the first time in my lifetime, uh, Speaker Madigan actually had to back down on some of the things that he wanted, and they actually reached a, reached a compromise, which is what it should happen. I know Susan did this when she was in Springfield and got things done. Um, I think it's a step in the right direction, but the reality is this is a state that's at the bottom of virtually every uh, economic measure. We need some of these reforms. Uh, we need to rein in our spending. We do need more revenues, and I think the governor put that on the table, so I think it's a great step forward, but the reality is we're a long way from getting the state turned around. You said that Madigan backed down, but didn't Rauner back down too? I mean, he didn't get a lot of the so-called turnaround agenda that he was looking for. Yeah, this was a compromise. What surprised me was uh, the recognition by the governor that uh, low-income neighborhoods um, are disproportionately affected by these budget cuts, and especially in education. And uh, so you see that the deal has produced a lot more money that's coming uh, to, to public schools and uh, especially primary school and, and, and secondary uh, schools. Those are the big winners in this, I think. And higher education, a lot of money that's going to college, which is sort of, you know, speaking to the issue of millennials, I think that that too is an issue that millennials care about. And, and uh, to the extent that the budget deal is delivering uh, resources to uh, public schools and to uh, uh, higher education, uh, this, this, this is what's going to motivate uh, young people to get involved. I think uh, you said it, that they're the most educated uh, demographic that there is, uh, is as part of the electorate. And uh, so I think that this is a very good thing. Uh, you know, it's sort of surprising to me, but I think both sides uh, see this as a compromise. But it's a short-term compromise. In the, as a long-term proposition, what we need is really progressive taxation in the state. Susan, so you've, been, you've been there uh, in Springfield. I have. My head is still spinning. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I watch this. It's always at the 11th hour. You know, you're forced into a corner. You have to vote one way or the other to make something happen. And I, you know, I, my heart went out to both sides of the aisle because they really had to do something. So was it a win? Was it a compromise? Um, I'm not in the General Assembly anymore. I hear from people on both sides of the aisle all the time, and they say, what just happened? You know, taxes are going to go up in Chicago. Nobody had a clue that that was really going to happen. There were no hearings. So, so the people that live in Chicago are going to pay a price. It might be necessary, but there should have been some discussion prior to that vote. But that, well, um, that's the mayor that wanted that, though. Yeah, right? of course he wanted it. But, you know, you have to have discussion. You and I aren't going to be paying all those taxes. Everybody in Chicago who just got hit with a tax increase. Well, that's, that, that's a very good point. I mean, Chicago just got this huge yeah. tax increase, and if you've been brave enough to open your August bill yet, I don't know, but the, I think the average increase is 13%, and this deal in Springfield is going to cause another $250 million in, in property taxes. Can, can Chicago stomach two property tax hikes in a row like this? Well, remember, too, there's also, as part of this, uh, some pension reform in there that hopefully there'll be some savings down the road that might offset some of the taxes. I don't live in the city, so I don't know, but it seems like the city's getting whacked pretty hard. Here yeah, this, is a, this, is a, this is a symptom of uh, a really bad uh, uh, taxation system right. where rich people, wealthy folks, uh, th this, this flight from taxation by, uh, by wealthy uh, individuals and corporations. You know, Mother Jones did a, a study recently showing that two-thirds of corporations are paying no income taxes at all. So the more that stays sort of as the status quo, the more likely we're going to see more and more of this going back to 
working people, uh, middle class families, uh, to 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 uh, uh, to pay for these uh, for these services. To remember, uh, Illinois, the the flat tax is in the constitution, so there's not much well, we can do about it right now. Yeah, it's it, well, Michigan amend the constitution. Let's move yes. to to the city desk for uh, just a bit. Here in Chicago, we just got through the Fourth of July weekend. The new police superintendent, Eddie Johnson, flooded the city with police. He rounded up uh, some gang suspects even before the weekend. Um, and halfway through the weekend, or two-thirds of the way through the weekend, he called it progress, yet more than 60 people were shot. Um, Pat, is the new superintendent doing the right thing here in Chicago? It's tough to say, and it's early, but I, I do think that he's doing the right thing and being as aggressive as he can without violating anybody's uh, civil rights, but it is a mess. And, uh, you know, eight years into the first African-American president in, in the history of the United States, we haven't got much federal help on one of, I think, the biggest problems in the country right now, and that's the murder rate and the sh shooting rate in the city of Chicago, one of the greatest cities in the world. So I wish, and I rarely or never as a Republican would call for this, but I think this calls for a grander strategy, uh, both federal and state, to deal with the city of Chicago. One specific concrete proposal that Superintendent Johnson has put forward as his predecessor, Gary McCarthy did. Um, Johnson is calling for stricter sentences, longer terms on repeat felony gun offenders. Susan, is this the way to go? Well, it may be, but I think what um, I've heard is that there needs to be training of the police, and the police have to have a stronger relationship and connection to people in the neighborhoods. What we hear is that um, people in, in name and name neighborhood, Englewood, they don't know who their police officers are. They're not from that neighborhood. They, they come in, they, you know, sometimes maybe wreak havoc on what's going on. So what the neighborhoods are saying is, we want our own to represent us, and we want them to be trained. We want them to work with us. We want them to play baseball with our sons. We want them to be a presence so we don't look at them in fear that they could come after us at any given moment in time. And I think that should be a key when somebody's coming up with a grand strategy sure. to Can make sure that there's a stronger, more positive relationship between the police and the communities. But we, we, policing we, always the most effective, but that can't underestimate the impact of this Laquan McDonald. But we've also, we've also no, had more than that three, part of a 300 murders already this year. We're, we're, way, uh, we're right on track to be way over, over last year. I mean, isn't it time to lock up, repeat multiple gun offenders? Uh, Chris, we've, 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 you know, Einstein said uh, the definition of stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same results. We've tried tough on crime. We've tried, we've tried three strikes are out. Now we have 2.2. That, 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 that was gen generally on, on other felonies. So we're talking specifically about guns here. Yeah, the, the issue of guns has to go to manufacturers. So if we don't, if we, if we don't have a conversation about manufacturers and reining them in, uh, really regulating guns at the source, the, you know, the... Uh, it, it makes no sense at all to continue to, to incarcerate people because it's not working. That's not a solution. We've already proven that. So this has to do, if you look at the neighborhoods where these crimes are taking place, the shootings are taking place, they have one thing in common, they're impoverished communities. So this failure to invest in these neighborhoods, provide jobs for people, youth programs in the summertime, that's what, we have to have a long sort of, a long-term view of this and not just react in the moment. You know, I agree with the tougher guns, but I think Sheriff Dart's onto something with treating people in his jail, a lot of which are mentally ill or have drug addiction problems. And to me, I was a prosecutor for 11 years, as, and I was a state's attorney here. Drugs are the root cause of a lot of this. It's either you're hyped up and you do a crime or you're, you're selling drugs to make money. Uh, so we need to get the drug problem under control in conjunction with the gun problem, and I think that's the solution. But man, repeat of uh, gun offenders throw you throw them away. The, the problems with the three strikes you're out, you were putting you know, kids in for drug offenses for the rest for, of their life. For minor drug it offenses. It didn't work. Yeah. Finally, here in Chicago, the Star Wars saga is over. George Lucas has decided not to build his uh, museum of narrative art here in Chicago on the lakefront. He had offered $800 million of his own money. Um, Susan, let me put this to you. Did Friends of the Park blow a good opportunity, or did they protect the lakefront for the citizens of Chicago? I would have loved to have seen the museum. Um, I never think it's a good idea when one special interest group, group has control of the agenda. Um, they're well respected, they do a lot of great things, but in this case, um, I think there should have been a little bit more collaboration. 
James, what's your take on this one? Kudos uh, to the uh, Friends of the Park. This was an, an, an example of what happens when a citizenry is mobilized uh, and organized and uh, put a stop to uh, This is more pandering, more, more catering to uh, wealthy elites. Uh, it, the pub public parks are public. Uh, we have a right to go to be in the lakefront to do uh, uh, barbecuing and grilling and and uh, by and cycling and so forth. Uh, the idea that the city can spend all this political energy and political capital on this one project for a Hollywood billionaire is is, is offensive. But that 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 said, Pat, I mean, this was going to be on a parking lot that's used ten days a year for tailgating for Bears games. Twelve, maybe, if they they're lucky enough to get to the playoffs. <laughs> Just don't take my spot. Uh, <laughs> I thought the thing was ugly, uh, but that being said, I think a, a bigger picture for the state, and I think what the governor is trying to do is we need more taxpayers in this state and more corporations in the state and more business in the state, and we need to create an environment where they want to come here, whether it's Lucas Museum or another big corporation to employ people so we have the resources to take care of the things that we all need, no need to be taken care of, and, and we just can't be an anti-business environment, which means... We need to get the public sector unions under control, and we've got to, get a, to take away the influence of the trial attorneys. And I think that's what the governor's trying to do, and I think in the long run, we can get all these things done we want to get done. It shows our lopsided priorities. You know, we're asking teachers, for example, to take furlough days and to pay, take, take pay cuts. And here we are, the political class is invested in this project, millions of dollars. Where are our priorities? Well, just, just to be fair, this was money that Lucas was going to put out of his own pocket, $800 well, million. There's, dollars. There, there are public subsidies to this. We just have 30 exactly. seconds left. Susan, what are the lessons here uh, for Chicago? Should we get something similar down the road? You know, I think it needs to be a much more open conversation. And I wasn't really exactly sure where the Friends of the Park were coming from. And I wasn't sure exactly where um, the mayor's office was coming from. And, and we were caught in between hearing both sides. Um, it needed to be, I think, uh, a little more, little more open and, and, a little bit and, better and transparent. And, 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 yes. on, on that note, I'm sorry we are out of time. And thanks to our guests, Pat Brady, James Denwa, and Susan Garrett. The summer boating and swimming season is well underway, but safety experts are warning of a little-known danger lurking in the water. It's called electric shock drowning. Over the last five years, at least 25 people have died across the country in accidents involving water and electricity. The electric shocks can occur without warning. Already this year, at least two people have been electrocuted, including a teenage girl killed in an Alabama lake. A 43-year-old California man also died while trying to rescue his daughter and five other children shocked in a Palm Springs swimming pool. Such electric shocks in the water can often lead to death and serious injury. Electric shock drowning is when electricity transfers into the human body from a boat or a dock and causes an individual to drown because their muscles shut down. Ron Sylvia is president of the Chicago Electric Boat Company, a boat rental service based out of Chicago's downtown Marina City. Sylvia says faulty wiring and broken grounding systems in docks and boats can lead to electricity leaking into the water. It's not something that you can see or hear. It is a, a silent killer. You drown alive. The deadly combination can also occur in pools and freshwater playgrounds that have a source of electricity. Sylvia says boat and dock owners should have their water tested and that boat electricians should be certified to work around water. Wiring a boat is very different from, you know, working in a household environment. Grant Crowley, owner of Crowley's Yacht Yard on Chicago's south side, trains boaters on safety standards. He says people should never swim near boat docks. When I see what's happening at marinas, it's the kids that are in the water swimming around the boats. And I walk up to the parents and they kind of say, you realize the kids are at risk where they are right now. Crowley says electric shock drowning is often misidentified and requires an in-depth investigation into the exact cause of death. The easiest thing is to mark somebody drowned. A lot of those might have electricity involved in the drowning. Experts say prevention and appropriate response are critical. 
For example, they say, don't swim near docks and marinas. If you feel tingling, swim away from the electricity source. If you see someone getting shocked, stay out of the water and cut off power at the source. Use a life ring or non-conductive object to help them. Call 911 and administer CPR if possible. And for more information on electric shock drowning, please visit our website at wycc.org and click on In the Loop. And now, speeding through the summer, you've heard of Tony Stewart, Jeff Gordon, Mario Andretti, but not everyone who races is famous or even wealthy. Some drivers you've never heard of go full throttle every Saturday night on a little dirt track just 90 miles northwest of Chicago. This is the scene every weekend at Wilmot Raceway, just over the Wisconsin state line. There are plenty of thrills and sometimes spills. Two basic types of cars compete here. The winged sprint cars, which seem to fly around the track, and the more traditional but souped up stock cars. This humble quarter mile track is a far cry from the famous Daytona or Indy 500 races, but the grandstands are always filled and the drivers are passionate about why they race. A need for speed, the thrill, the excitement. For 36 year old Rob Mall, racing is in his blood. My dad still races to this day. He's well past retirement age. He's been racing for about 50 some years now. So it was kind of expected of me to race, I guess. The same is true for Tom Homan, a retired race car driver. He remembers going to an old raceway with a childhood friend. His father used to take us to the track a lot, and my father would take us once in a while to the races when we were in grade school. And I just loved it. I loved the competition. Tom now owns car number 53 and hired Maul to drive it. He's a smart gentleman. He knows exactly what he's doing. A uh, very, very smart man. This is an expensive sport. A basic stock car fully equipped starts at about $2,500, not including the helmet, and driver's suit, and gloves. Drivers often do their own mechanical work, constantly making tweaks and repairs. But this is more than just a part-time hobby for these racers. It's an obsession. When we're not racing, we're usually working on the race car or talking about the next race. Uh, it consumes a lot of our life. It's a family affair. Maul's wife, Brooke, checks the tire pressure and helps her husband get strapped into the car before each race. It's something you definitely can't do without your family. Um, it's something you definitely can't uh, do half-heartedly. The pits, where cars get worked on and line up for the next race, is a beehive of activity, where friends sometimes drop by to chat before the races begin. It's a friendly rivalry. But yeah, when, you get, when they get out onto the track out there, there's no friends. This particular night honored Tom Homan's son Tommy with a memorial race. Tommy Homan Jr. was a standout driver at Wilmot who died of cancer in 2011. He was only 43. The drivers raced 35 laps, a reversal of Tommy Homan's number 53. Now Rob Mall drives that same car as a tribute. He was very tenacious behind the wheel. He won a lot of races. He did a lot with a little. Before the big race starts, Homan's family gathers on the track to take a few pictures and wave to the crowd. But when that green flag is waved to start the race, the niceties end, the gloves come off, and these fierce competitors go wheel to wheel, pedal to the metal for the sheer thrill of it all. Picking up the victory, the number 53, Rob Ball, your winner. And this year's annual Tommy Homan Memorial Race is set for Saturday, August 6th at Wilmot Raceway. You are now in the loop. Join us online to learn more about tonight's guests and our stories. Log on to WYCC.org and link on in the loop. Until next time, I'm Chris Bury. Good night.